All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back in session. Our jurors and alternates are present. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesdoff and Mr. DeGarren. We have Mr. Lewin, Mr. Milius, Mr. Henderson, Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Miata present. Uh, be before we uh, continue, ladies and gentlemen, on Thursday, uh, Mr. DeGarren erroneously argued that there was evidence that the Galveston jurors heard which you were not privy to in this case. You are not to consider why that jury reached the verdict that they did. You are to evaluate the evidence that was presented in this trial for the limited purposes that I have given to you already. Now with that, Mr. Chesnoff, you may resume your argument. These masks sometimes make it like you get, uh, I, apparently I either am speaking too soft or too loud because it reflects back and also it's a little hard for a fat old guy to breathe, but I'm doing the best I can. Bob did not kill Kathy Durst. Therefore, there was no great secret held by Susan Berman that threatened Bob. The evidence shows that after the disappearance of Kathy Durst, there was an exhaustive New York police investigation involving the New York Police Department and the New York State Police, two renowned police organizations, two of the most respected police agencies in the world. Bob Durst was never charged with any crime in the disappearance of Kathy Durst. You heard from Detective Michael Strzok of the NYPD, assigned to the Homicide Division. He testified that Bob came directly to his office to report Kathy missing. He came without an attorney. You remember he brought a copy of a magazine with his dad on it and with some other celebrated New Yorkers. He didn't do that to show off. He did that to impress upon Detective Strzok that they were real people of substance. They wanted help. He did it to get Detective Strzok to find Kathy. He brought it with him and showed him, this is who we are in New York City. Help me find my wife. He was trying to motivate them. That's why he brought it. That's not someone with consciousness of guilt. We know Bob's not the best communicator all the time. But he can still make his opinion known. And what did he do? A lot was made out of the fact that he didn't call her family. With all due respect, if your wife is missing, you tell the police, help. Help find my wife. And since he put her on the train and knew she was going to New York, he went to the New York City police because that's where the train was going. Then they hired private investigators. I think the testimony was it was somebody that specialized in finding missing people. They offer rewards. I think it was $100,000. That's a lot of money in, in, in the early 80s. It's a lot of money now. You heard evidence that Detective Strzok interview of Bob's South Salem neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Mayor, contemporaneous with other police witnesses. And in the original interview of the mayors, they did not cast suspicion on Bob at all. In fact, much of what they testified to years and years later, 40 years later almost, they didn't tell the police when they were first interviewed. We had a stipulation to that effect. The prosecution acknowledged that when the police were interviewing the mayors immediately upon investigating the case, the mayors didn't say many of the things that they said in court. You know the one thing they didn't say? They didn't talk at all about the spooky blue light. What the heck is that? Ooh, we're supposed to go, there was a blue light in the basement. 
like we're teenagers watching a movie. They didn't say anything about a blue light at that time. If they had, could the police have recovered a blue light? Sure, they were in the house. But you guys all know they didn't find one thing in the South Salem house suggesting that Kathy's disappearance had anything other than to do with whatever happened to her once she got on their chain. The people did stipulate that the police reports related to the mayor's interviews do not include information related to what the mayors later stated and testified in court. They added information. That is not reliable. You don't need anybody to tell you that at the time the police are talking to neighbors contemporaneous with the missing person, that what the police learn from the people is going to be the best information. You would think that the neighbors would be interested in helping find her. The policemen are there. They've got their notepads out. They're taking notes. And they're asking questions, and the mayor gives them statements. One of the things they did say that was in the original interview was that Bob's car was not there at the time that Bob was taking her to the train station. The car was not there, consistent with Bob's testimony that he took her to the train. They didn't make any mention of domestic violence or a divorce when they first spoke to the police. Now, if you're suspicious of somebody and there's, somebody's disappeared, that might be something you can tell the police, but the mayors didn't do that. By the way, Najami also confirmed that Bob told her he took her to the train. There is no evidence that Kathy Durst didn't get on the train. Did they bring anybody? that interviewed somebody who worked on the train, who worked at the, at, the, uh, at the station? Did they find surveillance of that train and bring it to you and show no Kathy? It's not Bob's fault, there's no evidence. It's not his fault. He told them he took her to the train. It's kind of outrageous to try to convict someone because the police didn't recover evidence. You'd think a search of the house would have revealed something. Not one scintilla of evidence from that house whatsoever of physical evidence suggesting that anything happened to Kathy Durst in the house. Now, people do take off on their spouses all the time. And New York City is a dangerous place. It really is in the 1980s. And here's another interesting fact. If they had found any real blood of Kathy Durst in that house, blood typing existed in 1982. It's not 1882. They had scientific testing that they could have used to prove that Kathy came to harm in that house. Nothing. Detective Strzok, after two years, could not explain what happened to Kathy. That's not Bob's fault. Bob went to the police. For two years, they searched. Rewards were offered. Nothing. That means that there was no evidence that she was killed in the house or fell down the stairs, as was suggested. Mr. Lewin promised during his opening statement We'll demonstrate that Kathy Durst never left that house. She got home and he killed her. Demonstrate? You don't have anything more than that statement. Demonstrate means produce evidence. Show you. We're talking about a murder charge. We're talking about convicting somebody. They want to convict somebody of murder. They tell you they're going to show you she never left the house, and they show you nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, they completely failed to prove 
anything happened to Kathy Durst in that house. The prosecution argues that Detective Strzok didn't do a good job, except when they want to cross-examine Bob, then they use his notes, and then his notes are awesome. It's kind of a lot of what goes on here. Somebody's no good, but they're good when we can use them. Uh, it, if she fell down the stairs, no, he killed her. I mean, it's, it, it's just throw it against the wall and something will stick. Well, that doesn't count in the trial in California, in the United States of America. Like I said earlier, this isn't a foreign country where the government says, we think you did this. We're going to lock you up. Oh, we'll have a trial. There'll be a couple of judges that both work for the government, and they'll listen to it, and they'll convict you. That's not what we have. We have you. We have his honor. We understand that Kathy's family has unanswered questions. So does Bob. So does Bob. So does Bob. I mean, when you think about it, even something was made of the fact that he described what kind of coat she had on when she got on the train. Of course you would if it's the last time you saw your wife. You'd remember, and it was a distinctive coat. It was a down coat, one of those puffy things with the patches. He told you about it. Now, also, and I don't say this to be critical of, of, of Mrs. Durst, but it's undisputed she had serious alcohol and she had cocaine issues. That's undisputed. She also had boyfriends. That was testified to. She was having problems in school. I'm not telling you that to be mean. I'm telling you that so you get the whole story here of what was going on. And that the reality was she had issues. By the way, Detective Strzok had no incentive or motive to help Mr. Durst. He wanted to find her. He wanted to find out what happened. Many people were interviewed. Bob assisted him. He cooperated in searches of the house. Remember, he gave them complete access to the home without a warrant. They could go anywhere. He let them in. Now we're supposed to hear that, well, they didn't do as thorough a job as they should. Shame on them. Shame on them. So the fact that they didn't do as thorough a job, which the prosecution concedes, means that they didn't find evidence. But you guys should just assume that if they had done a thorough job, they'd have found it. That's nonsense. That's scary, actually. They offered a $100,000 reward. His family hired investigators. The police did not recover a single piece of evidence. Not a fiber, blood, skin, DNA, to suggest anything happened to Kathy in that house. It's a small house. It's a cat cottage. This is a murder prosecution, for God's sakes. The police have full access to the place, and they don't find one thing. Cold cases, they preserve stuff for 30 years, 40 years. And then there's a cold case prosecution, and they go into the evidence vault, and they pull it out, and they go, remember the fiber we found? We can check it for DNA. It's done all the time. The idea that somehow CSI people are just guys on television with big builds or whatever that was, they're scientists. They solve crimes every day. To diminish the value of CSI to explain your lack of evidence is what they did. They put down the very people they work with all the time because there's no evidence. They have no choice. They're no good. They don't really solve cases all the time. The police were given free access by the way, the police always suspect the husband when the wife's missing. So, man's letting you in the house. Do your job. Do your job. For two years, some of them did. And they didn't find one piece of evidence to present to you 
that anything happened in that house. Bob continued to live in the house for years after Kathy's disappearance. He wasn't running from the police at that time. To the contrary, he was cooperating and he organized resources to locate her. The New York police did an investigation for over two years. The prosecution's argument that NYPD could have done more is unsupported. What else could they have done? Four decades of DAs in Westchester apparently agree. Again, Mr. Lewin said he would prove that Kathy was killed in the house. He hasn't. After the investigation was reopened, they searched the lake. They came back in and took out pieces of the house. Remember that? From a new owner. They tested them. CSI. Apparently in New York, they think CSI is OK. In fact, at one point, they found something they thought was blood, and it wasn't. If Bob had chopped up a body there, there would absolutely have been forensic evidence in that house. It doesn't leave. The police can find forensic evidence years later. That's what true cold case prosecutions do. To diminish the value of CSI like the prosecution did is only because they had to because they didn't find anything, ever. And you know why they didn't find anything? Because it didn't happen there, as they say. She did not get hurt, killed in that house. Bob, who didn't have to testify, very telling when asked if Kathy got on the train. He answered honestly that she was in a group of people, the train came, and then she was gone. He could have easily said, I saw her get on the train, I saw the door close, I saw her take her seat. He didn't. He told you exactly what happened. Commuters from, uh, from South Salem, train station, platform, doors open, group of people, train takes off, and Kathy's not there. That's what he told you. Bob knew he was going to be asked about that, but he told it to you exactly how it happened. And again, it's not our obligation to prove what happened. It's the prosecution's burden to prove what happened. And they can't contradict that at all. Theory, gossip, rumors, movies. We had to watch that abysmal movie. They don't count. That's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You cannot find evidence that is not there if nothing happened. They searched. No evidence because there is no proof that Kathy died in the South Salem home. And this was not just the NYPD back in the 80s. It also involved the New York State Police. You heard from Trooper Harney. Trooper Harney said 35 years later, the police reports are the most accurate recitation of witness interviews, not what people say in court years later. That directly contradicts the Myers failure to remember what they actually said, and I hate to say it, their false testimony at the trial, all embellished by false memories. Trooper Harney testified that Bob voluntarily invited the police into the home, the alleged scene of the crime. No signs of foul play were observed. No signs of foul play were observed. Bob didn't say, do you have a warrant? Didn't say, I want a lawyer. As I said earlier, the husband's always a suspect. And they had a voluntary interview with him and free reign of the house. This baloney that cops are somehow smarter now and no more the 1980s were modern times. These were real professional policemen trying to find out what happened. Not only is there no evidence that Bob killed Kathy, but there is also no evidence of what happened to her, other than she got on the train. That's not Bob's fault. 
It happens all the time. People turn up years later. I'm not suggesting at this point in time that that's realistic, but it's just an example that you can rely on your common sense to know that people disappear. It's sad. It's horrible for the families. But it doesn't mean that everybody who disappears either fell victim to whoever someone suspects. It doesn't mean that. The evidence in trial showed that Kathy had difficulties in school and had many absences and to a large degree was leading a dysfunctional life. Part of it as a result of the relationship, obviously. Remember, there was already a pre-existing history regarding Kathy's problems at school. They had nothing to do with Bob. For example, in 1980, she was unable to attend a large part of her clerkship. The school was also disappointed in her lack of responsibility in spite of repeated reminders. That's in Defense Exhibit C. A letter dated March 9, 1981, from an assistant dean for the students, Jean L. Cook, which states, Dear Ms. Durst, I understand from my office that things aren't going too smoothly for you right now. Would you like to talk to me? Do you think I can help? Defense Exhibit B. On March 10, 1981, Mrs. Durst withdrew from her clerkship for personal reasons. Defense Exhibit B. This is real evidence and real documents that were presented to you so you would understand that we are telling you about what Kathy was enduring in school, not to uh, uh, suggest she's a bad person, just to tell you that the idea that somehow everything was honky-dory for her at the school and that she wouldn't call the dean is nonsense. As you know from the evidence, it was Dean Kent Cook who Kathy Durst called on February 1st, 1982, and the call was transferred to Dean Cooperman. This evidence, actual evidence in this case, shows the Dean's pre-existing communications and why Kathy would call. And I'm going to discuss that further. Again, not trying to hurt her reputation, but the people in meeting their burden have painted her as a perfect student without any problems. Just not true. She disappeared. Drug people are dangerous. Boyfriends who use drugs are dangerous. The streets of New York City are dangerous. There are many unknown explanations for disappearances. Another letter on July 14th, 81, from the Department of Radiology wrote Ms. Durst and informed her that because she never completed her clerkship, her evaluations remained deferred. The letter noted the school called Kathy numerous times and wrote letters, and she did not respond. Defense Exhibit C, that's real evidence. The prosecution argues that her issues at school were too remote from her time of disappearance. That's not true. As I will explain further, the evidence showed that Dean Cook and Cooperman were expecting the call she made because she had ongoing issues. Now, we presented some conditional witnesses to you. That meant they were the same as witnesses in court, but they were recorded at a prior time because of concerns of their age or their health that they might not be available for you folks to hear. And that's what Dr. Cooperman was, a conditional witness. And uh, uh, so it's the same weight, takes the same importance that you give to it of any other witness. Just because it was on the video doesn't make it less valuable than a live witness in court. Dean Cooperman testified that he was aware of her significant absences and there was concern. Question, were you aware that towards the end of her medical school career, Kathleen Durst was having some absences? Yes. Were the absences significant enough where you were particularly concerned about them? Yes. This was testified to by Dr. Cooperman on direct examination from the prosecution. They elicited that. Cooperman further testified, 
She also withdrew from the surgery, excuse me, from the radiology clerkship. Right, radiology. And she also withdrew from the neurology clerkship. Right. So surgery, radiology, neurology, three withdrawals in the same year. Isn't that a little unusual? Which is why Dr. Cook was concerned about her? That was the evidence. The evidence showed that Kathy's drinking and drug use over her medical career contributed to her doing poorly at school and may explain her disappearance. The evidence showed Kathy was living a somewhat unstable life, at times apart from Bob. You heard that. She enrolled in rehab. That is a private matter. That info doesn't get shared. Why doesn't it get shared? To encourage people to seek rehab. The point was made that she might apply to Lenox where she was getting the rehab and they would share the... The school and the hospital would be happy that a person was trying to get sober, to be well. They would not use it against you. And prosecution could have refuted that claim. Did you see them bring anybody from Lenox Hill Hospital to tell you that she didn't go to rehab? That's their burden. They can't just tell you, oh, she didn't go to rehab. That doesn't count. What counts is evidence. Lenox Hill program, as Bob said, was an experimental program. Doctors and lawyers have drug problems. That's known. For Kathy to have a drug problem in the 80s in New York City was not out of the ordinary. But apparently she was seeking help. Prosecution made it sound like she wouldn't go to rehab. We should be glad she did. The parties consulted lawyers, meaning Bob and Kathy, about their family dis uh, marital disputes, including the idea of staying together. And on the weekend in South Salem, before she went back into the city, they were together. No divorce was ever filed by either party. They were still spending time together, the home and the cottage, and sometimes in New York. They were enjoying it even when they were having trouble which if we put on our own life experiences, we all know of circumstances where people are having trouble in marriages, difficult times, but they stay together. You heard evidence on, on the afternoon and early evening of January 31st, Kathy Durst was at a party at her friend Gilberti's. She drove to her house about four. Bob spoke to her several times on the phone and she assured him she would be home. As you know, Kathy was attending medical school then. Kathy was supposed to start her clerkship for her senior year the next day. So on January 31st, the day before she was to start her senior clerkship, she was at the Jami's house drinking, even though she was supposed to start a new rotation at medical school early Monday morning. No wonder she called in sick. You know that she has substance problems. You know she's having trouble in school. There's nothing inconsistent with the idea that she called in sick. The mayors testified they had often seen her drinking too much. Bob, who isn't thrilled what Kathy is doing with Gilberti to begin with, because he sees Gilberti as a wedge between them, wants her to come home. So about 7.30 PM, she comes home. When she arrived back at the house, Bob could tell she was drinking. She needed to go to New York for her rotation. He didn't want to drive her into the city because he needed the car the next morning to take the dog to the vet. That's uncontroverted. Bob took the keys to the vehicle so she couldn't drive. Somebody arguing that she should have been allowed to drive showed he cared. He also needed the car to take the dog to the vet. They got into an argument, as Bob acknowledged. She agreed to take the train. Bob had driven the car to South Salem. It was the only car they had. At about 8.50 PM, they left together. And Meyer said the car was gone. And Bob drove her to the Katona train station. Remember, Kathy's clerkship was to start the next day. 
She had to get back to the city. Bob dropped her off at the station and she took the train. As I told you a little while ago, she was wearing a large beige tan coat and he remembered it. He remembered what his wife was wearing the last time he saw her. People have tumultuous marriages and still love each other. Bob went back to the South Salem home and went to sleep. He wouldn't know something was wrong. Mr. Lewin stated during the opening, there is no evidence that Mrs. Durst got on that train. The evidence actually shows she did. They didn't present anybody to say that she didn't. They didn't present anybody. You gotta remember, they had investigators working at the time to interview conductors, to interview the people that sell tickets, to look to see if there was any film. They had all that. The police had the chance to do all that. And you didn't hear one result of the police investigation. You heard real evidence that Mrs. Durst was alive after January 31st on February 1st, 1982, between 9 and 11 a.m., which completely contradicts the idea that she died in the house on January 31st. And why is that? Because she spoke with Dr. Dean Albert Cooperman at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. Dr. Cooperman was a brilliant and accomplished man who was at his full strength in 1982, when he remembered speaking to Kathy. You heard testimony that Kathy actually called Assistant Dean of Students, Dr. Gene Cook's office, whose secretary then transferred the call to Dean Cooperman that Dr. Cook was not in. Remember, Cook and Cooperman were expecting calls and that was documented. You heard evidence that Cooperman was expecting the call and it was transferred to him. Dr. Cooperman testified. This is a question from Mr. Balian. So the call, we were talking about the calls. They would come into Dr. Cook's secretary if the call was made to Dr. Cook, and then she would transfer the call to who, or he, she or he, my secretary, to your secretary. And then what would that individual, your secretary, do with the call? Would call me. And then they would transfer it to you, Right. He also testified, and Dr. Cook warned you before he took off the week of February 1st to be on the lookout for Kathy Durst calling in ill, didn't he? He did alert me to that fact. Yes, key word, fact. And he didn't alert you to any other student, did he? No. That's why the parade of doctors who were classmates who said, She'd never do that. It's nonsense. Remember that? We had to listen to doctor after doctor after doctor tell, if I were in medical school, I would have never called. Well, that may have applied to them. But that was just to get you to keep your eye, take your eye off the ball. The ball coming at you says he was expecting the call, and the call came. So we listened to all these doctors tell you it couldn't happen, but the man who got the call told you it could, he told you why, and he told you what was said. In my conversation with Dr. Cook, it seemed to me he was indicating she might call in as being absent. This is from Mr. DeGarren on cross. So it was concerning enough to Dr. Cook to warn you about being on the lookout for a call from Kathy Durst. Right. When the call was transferred, Kathy told Dean Cooperman that she was suffering from gastrointestinal issues headache, diarrhea, which by the way, cocaine and a hangover can cause, and was unable to attend school for clinic duty, which was the first day of her clerkship. <clears throat> this call lasted several minutes. I think he said five. I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna pause for two minutes so you can get an idea of how long he was on the phone with her. There wasn't some flip thing. This is a brilliant guy talking to someone he expected a call from. Just sit here for a couple of minutes.
you get the point. Plenty of time to identify her voice and that she was a medical student. Now, I was listening to the memorials for 9-11 the other day and I had a lot of folks from New York or so many of the people that perished. And I'm listening and you can hear the New York accents when they're reading the names or making comments about the people and it, it dawned on me. Dean Cooperman knows a New York accent. Kathy had a New York accent. Susan Berman was from the West Coast. Susan Berman is from the West Coast, speaks differently than Kathy Durst, who grew up and spent her whole life in New York. Dean Cooperman told that to the police 38 years ago. This learned man, he knew her. She wasn't an unknown student. He says, I spoke to her. Well, he knows what she sounds like, or you don't say that. He heard her. She needed someone higher up to help her with her problems and with her excuse. She wasn't like the other doctors who said that they would call differently. She had a protocol put in place for her at the direction of Dr. Cook. Fellow students said she wouldn't have called. That's a fatal flaw in their case. They put those people on. You parade a slew of doctors whose father-in-law and grandfather-in-law weren't benefactors of a school to tell you they wouldn't call the dean. Well, Kathy Durst called the dean. The prosecution did not prove that she got into any other schools, as was suggested. The Durst's had a relationship with the school, and that's why Kathy called the dean. That's not a coincidence. Bob showed his love for her by supporting her going to medical school and any help her family, his family could give. That's not a put down to Kathy. That's a great thing. Instead of somebody being restricted from going to elite, an elite school because maybe they didn't go to an elite college, they encouraged her to go and she got in. We know they were wrong, these doctors, because the evidence is unequivocal that Dean Cook and Cooperman were expecting the call. So the prosecution's argument is that it would be uncommon for a student to call the dean. Again, Dean Cooperman and Dr. Cook were expecting the call. That theory from the prosecution is not true. And no matter how many doctors they paraded before you, they were all wrong. The evidence shows that clearly. Dr. Cooperman said the following. Question, why do you say the secretary in Dr. Cook's office? Why do you assume that would have been a secretary in Dr. Cook's? Because that, that was the rule. If you were going to be absent from a clerkship or any clinical duty, you would call that office. He then went on to say, so are you saying in addition to calling the clerkship to let them know you're not going to be there? There was also some general rule that the students had to call Dr. Cook as well. No, it's not a general rule. It's in the particular case. What was your understanding? You'll have to say that again. What was your understanding in this particular case? Dr. Cook was concerned about absences that Kathy Durst had during several of her previous clerkships. Going back to the third year, and for reasons which I'm not completely aware of, I wanted to make sure that she did complete her clerkships in time for graduation, and if there's any difficulty, he wanted to know about them. And this is something I'm assuming you remembered based on the conversation you had with Dr. Cook? Right. This is compelling evidence. Compelling, which completely contradicts the prosecution's theory in the case. What is significant to note the evidence showed that when Bob reported, this is very important, when Bob reported Kathy missing, Detective Strzok says he called Dr. Cook, not Dr. Cookerman, Cooperman. Well, this is not happening after the prosecution alleges Susan posed as Kathy to call the school. If Bob and Susie had talked, Bob would have known that she spoke to Cooperman not Cook, and Strzok would have called Cooperman. But Strzok called Cook. 
because that's the information he had from Bob and others. There was no plot here. There was no plot. That's a very, very telling, telling fact. Important to remember. There's no collusion between Susan and Bob. If Bob had been in cahoots with Susan, he would have told, and Strzok would have called Cooperman, not, not Cook. Strzok called Cook first. And he wasn't told by Bob at any time that you heard that he was told to call Cooperman by Bob. Bob didn't know who Kathy spoke to. Dean Cooperman maintained for years that it was Kathy on the call. He was one of the most consistent witnesses. Plus, he had no incentive to make that up. He has no dog in that fight. He would want to find and help find a missing student. Their case is built on this entire premise. They're wrong. The prosecution has proposed that the alleged secret Susan carried with her for 18 years was that she called the medical school posing as Kathy. This evidence has now been shown as a result of the trial that we've all been in to be nothing more than an urban legend. It's nothing but a theory created out of whole cloth to justify their argument that Susan Berman is a witness. And in order for him, Bob, to be convicted, she has to be a witness. So if that's not true, she's not a witness. And he's not guilty. Their theory emerged through articles. And after the movie All Good Things came out, which somehow proposed that Susan was trying to assist Bob in a cover-up. Frightening a screenplay of a bad movie led us here. Frightening. Not only did Dean Cooperman report the call from Kathy to police over 38 years ago, but you heard Dean Cooperman's recent testimony, which was evidence at trial. Again, the prosecution said it was unusual for a student to call an administrator, but the evidence shows that Dr. Cooperman was expecting the call. Their misstatements are very telling and shows reasonable doubt. I want to highlight further that in his detailed and concise cross-examination, Mr. DeGaran elicited the following testimony from Dr. Cooperman, and this is going to be by way of a video. You were actually expecting a call from uh, Kathy Harris that day, weren't you? Yes. Sure. Yes, I did. And the reason you were expecting a call was because of your uh, knowledge that you got from Dr. Cook and your views of records and so forth. And Dr. Cook was very concerned about Kathy missing classes. Yes. And that um, he told you to be on the lookout for a call. Yes. And the way the call came in, as, as best you can figure out, is that it may have called come to Dr. Cook's office. He was gone, wasn't he? Right. right. And then Dr. Cook's secretary switched it to your secretary who gave the call to you. Right. And so when um, Kathy Durk said, I'm Kathy Durk, and I can't make it today because I'm sick, but I would exact where it were. That wasn't Right. She described diarrhea. 
two important things to take away from that. He said she sounded like a medical student, which Kathy was, and he was asked about this by law enforcement multiple times and never changed his opinion. Multiple times. During his testimony, Dr. Cooperman also acknowledged that in a previous interview with the Jinx producer on February 17, 2012, that he said the caller, caller sounded like Kathy. You don't say it sounds like somebody unless you know what their voice is. He said it sounded like Kathy. How do you say it sounded like someone you never spoke to? He's a brilliant man helping the police to try to find a missing student. He testified, as another video will show. Do you recall the interview, Dr. The uh, producers of the movie Jinx telling that what the prosecution has supplies is an accurate uh, transcription of that interview when the producers of the Jinx came to see you told them, didn't you, that it sounded like her? If that's what it said, I, then I don't recall it. But well, let's just go back to the page. Uh, uh, page 6. Um, you start to talk about it, this must be maybe 10 years ago. That's when the detectives came around for the second round of interviews. And then on page seven, you said, it's a, it sounded like her. That's what you said, right? Okay, that's, that's what it says, I He said it sounded like Kathy. Accordingly, there was a very detailed call. It took a while. Remember the pause. Went on. And he has no incentive at the time to be mistaken. He knew her. He recognized the voice. It was not until he was pressured to question his memory that he ever questioned himself. However, his memory was fresh when he first reported it and in the multiple interviews before a slight change of mind. Remember, his initial memories are when he was 40 years younger, a brilliant, brilliant doctor who was trying to help the police with accurate and truthful information. Even though Mr. Dr. Cooperman did not appear in person, he gave his testimony by way of conditional examination. And as the court has instructed you, you must evaluate this testimony by the same standards that you apply to a witness who testified here in court. Because Kathy called the medical school, that was mean she was not killed in the South Salem home as the prosecution stated on January 31st. Kathy was not killed by Bob, and their entire case is based on this false premise. Another false premise is that Susan Berman called the school, and that's the secret she allegedly held. However, there is absolutely no evidence at our trial of any calls between Bob and Susan preceding the call to Dean Cook that got transferred to Dean Cooperman. Not a single record that Bob Durst had any communication with Susan Berman the night of the 31st. That's what, that's what it would take. If she's, Susan is calling the next day, Bob would have had to tell her, what evidence did they show to you at all of any communication between Bob Durst and Susan Berman to put this thing together. Nothing. Zero. 
It was a toll call from South Salem to New York, where Susan was. Is there a record shown to you that Bob Durst called Susan Berman? None. That's their burden. In five months, they have not shown you any proof whatsoever that Bob Durst communicated with Susan Berman about making the phone call. That's their job. And it becomes your job to say, you know what? That Mr. Chesnoff, he yells a lot and he gets emotional and he's whatever. But he's right. How can you claim that a conspiracy existed between Bob and Susan when you have not seen one bit of evidence to suggest that they even talked about it? Detective Becerra told you there were no records of any calls or conversations between Mr. Durst and Susan Berman on the night of the 31st. For that matter, I think he extended it several days through the 3rd, the 4th. The same applied to the FBI agent, who is the master phone record guy for the FBI in New York City, said there were no records showing that Bob had talked at all to Susan Berman. How did the conspiracy occur if there are no records? How does the conspiracy occur if they can't prove to you that Bob ever spoke to Susan? They can't. That means there is no proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Susan was a witness. And the element of the crime that they have charged him with, which they're asking you to convict him of, requires that. And they just haven't done it. They certainly haven't done it beyond a reasonable doubt. Whatever you may think of their theory, they have not proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. If there was evidence, they would have presented it. That's their responsibility in meeting the burden of proof. If there was a toll call between South Salem, where Bob was, and New York City, where Susan was, there would be phone records, but none exist. If she didn't call, there is no secret. There is nothing to be a witness about. Might be entertaining for a fictional movie. Not entertaining when someone's life's on the line. And there is certainly no evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. None. Bob did not speak to Susan to plot a call to the dean. This goes directly to the fact that they have not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Bob is guilty of mur murdering Susan Berman because she was a witness. That Susan would sometimes exaggerate and want attention does not mean there is evidence of this alleged call. The prosecution needs to produce evidence, legal evidence. They don't have it. By the way, no law enforcement person ever spoke to Susan Berman to ask her about the call. But they want you to find that she was a witness, but they didn't think it important enough to speak to her. Nothing occurred between 1982 and Susan's death in 2000 where a single police officer, DA, DA investigator, ever spoke to her and asked her a single question. And yet they want you to say she was a witness because she supposedly made the call to Einstein, which Cooperman has told you it wasn't her. That means they haven't proven their case. The prosecution wants you to believe their theory was so strong and was so supported and incredible, yet law enforcement didn't speak to her about this in 18 years between the dis de Kathy's disappearance and Susan's death. You heard from numerous law enforcement witnesses. There were many other law enforcement uh, people involved in these investigations. Investigators, detectives, troopers, DAs. They didn't call Susan once to speak to her about the alleged call or to discuss her alleged involvement whatsoever. That is completely undisputed. Yet they want you to find somebody guilty of murdering a witness that they never spoke to? 
they never thought was important enough? Most of the police probably accepted the truth, which was Dr. Cooperman telling the police it was her. Detective Becerra testified at trial. I'm going to discuss some of his other testimony, but significantly, it's a video. Did you ever uncover in the course of the investigation that you conducted at any time any physical evidence like a phone bill or a note, anything at all to show that Susan Berman had ever talked to Bob Durst between January 31st and February 3rd? I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't know. If I, well, that would be a that would be a big one for you, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. But I'm just trying to think if it was done by other law enforcement involved. Okay. Well, if I saw something, you know what I mean. That's all. Okay. Well, listen. Time. Listen. Okay. Listen to the question. Okay. Can't okay, answer only the question. The question is about you. Were you I there? personally know. So you were the lead investigator, correct? Of the reopening. Yes. Okay. And in the course of being the lead investigator, at no time do you. Did you personally or do you have any memory of ever seeing a single piece of physical evidence showing that Mr. Durst had spoken to Susan Berman between January 31st and February 3rd, correct? Correct. The evidence related to Kathy calling the dean on February 1, 1982 is significant because it shows you that this entire case is premised on false assumptions presented by the prosecution. Not only, is there not only is there evidence which completely belies their theory, but there's no evidence as to how this alleged murder of Kathy Durst ever occurred. So there's no evidence at all that Bob killed his beloved wife, and there's no evidence that Susan killed the dean. Moreover, in a day and age where there no were no cell phones, the evidence showed that Bob could not kill Kathy and coordinate with Susan Berman to call the dean by the next morning. There are no records supporting their theory. All of the jury instructions in this case, read by his honor, are obviously important. However, there's a very important instruction that you can apply in this case as to whether Susan was a witness and that's whether she, why she was um, murdered. Because you may rely on circumstantial evidence to conclude a fact necessary to find the defendant guilty has been proved, you must be convinced that the people have proved each fact essential to that conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt. As the court also instructed, there are two types of evidence, direct and circumstantial. However, before you may rely on circumstantial evidence to find the defendant guilty, you must be convinced that the only reasonable conclusion supported by the circumstantial evidence is that the defendant is guilty. If you, this, if you can draw two or more reasonable conclusions from the circumstantial evidence, and one of those reasonable conclusions points to innocence, and another to guilt, you must accept the one that points to innocence. That is an instruction from his honor. When considering circumstantial evidence, you must accept only reasonable conclusions and reject those that are unreasonable. Here, the reasonable conclusion is Kathy called the school, not Susan. Therefore, Susan was not a witness. The judge is telling you that if you are looking at this and you think they are making an argument that has some merit, but wait, the defense made an argument that also has merit, that tells you that it wasn't proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant innocent. Your Honor, that's an improper statement of law. It's not exactly correct. It's, a, it's an argument, but uh, read the instruction and rely on the instruction. I, I apologize if I misstated something. You get my point. You heard that it was only until recently that law enforcement and the prosecution tried to see doubt in Dr. Cooperman and pressure him to change his story. Shame on them. He testified as follows. 
And um, you also got the idea that the police were kind of trying to pressure you into saying that it wasn't her. Right? I, I don't recall the pressure, but I think there was some, something about the conversation that indicated to me that, um, that that's what they were aiming at. Yeah, the police were trying to get you out If you call that pressure, you know. Right. Well, uh, let's look at what you said. On that same day, May 7, the question is asked to you, uh, please make a big deal. Yes. Yes. Right there. Uh, I'm sorry. You were asked, because did you feel like you were being pressured? And your answer was yes. So he says, uh huh, because he was pressured. Because they knew how crucial his identification of Kathy calling the school was. So, in spite of the fact that for 35 years this doctor said the same thing, they then pressured him. And that is shameful. Please also consider the testimony from Dr. Loftus related to these issues of memory. I know that Mr. Durst, when he testified, said that he believed that some people had had memories of things that Susan had said. I want us to rely on the science in evaluating the evidence and what Dr. Loftus shared with us. She told you that when a person is given negative feedback about an identification, their confidence can go down. Conversely, if positive feedback is given, a person's confidence in recalling a memory can be artificially inflated. Cooperman, for years, when the police were conducting proper interviews with him, always said it was Kathy. Then, he gets pressured, his confidence goes down, not to the point where he says it's not Kathy. Remember that also. But the fact is, Dr. Cooperman is 100% believable in his original and 35 years of confidence that he identified Kathy as the caller. Dr. Cooperman never had a reason to lie, and the prosecutor's dismissal of this evidence is very telling for your deliberation. Dr. Cooperman is a very clear witness in this case because he establishes that Kathy was alive after the prosecution says Bob killed her. And his testimony proves that Susan did not help Bob cover up the murder. This is objective, competent, and unbiased evidence from Dr. Cooperman. Now, Bob is in charge in this case with the death of Kathy no one's ever been charged. He's presumed innocent. Kathy was reported missing. Susan, Bob's longtime best friend from UCLA, helped to be a spokesperson. That's not evidence of Bob's guilt. You heard she was a loyal friend. She gossiped and made up stories, but she was still a loyal friend. They were close friends before Kathy's disappearance and remained friends afterwards until her death. And by the way, that's another interesting thing when I told you earlier that they go back and forth. One minute she's loyal, the next minute she's going to tell the cops about Bob. One minute she's as tough as nails, the next minute she's going to tell on Bob. One minute she's asking for money in a way because she's suffering, the next minute it's extortion. Then her friends testify that she would never extort Bob, so now it's not extortion. It always goes back and forth. The idea is just throw it out there and make something stick. You heard evidence that Susan was an accomplished writer and journalist. She wasn't afraid of the media and wasn't easily intimidated. Bob's family was high profile and the stories were in the media. Remember you heard evidence that Bob at times doesn't communicate that well and the disappearance of his wife and all the attention was upsetting to him for the same reason it would be upsetting to anyone. 
that Susan Berman wanted to help Bob during this hard time does not mean that she covered up Kathy's death. death. You also heard evidence that the New York investigation was not reopened on credible evidence. You heard from Detective Becerra. Your Honor, this might be a, is it a little too early? Too early. Okay, I'll keep plugging along. You heard from Detective Becerra. He testified that the investigation in New York was only reopened after a man who was flashing himself to a woman claimed he had information regarding Bob Durst and the disappearance of Kathy Durst. Here we go again. Some guy's trying to get out of trouble, some pervert. Let's blame Bob. And they immediately go. To Detective Becerra's credit, he knew the guy was full of it. The information turned out to be inaccurate, as testified by Detective Becerra. Did you check out the information he had provided to some extent? I did. And did it turn out to be accurate information? It wasn't accurate, but the information he provided definitely piqued my interest on in this particular case. Okay. And what case was he talking about? When I met with him, he stated that um, there was a murder that occurred in South Salem in 1982 and that an individual named Robert Durst killed his wife, Kathy Durst. Okay. So he told you about the general case. He gave you some specific information. You ran down that information. It did not turn out to be fruitful, correct? That is correct. So you heard after the alleged tip from the sex offender, this sparked Detective Becerra and ultimately hard charging and attention seeking former DA Janine Pirro. You may know her from Fox News. Importantly, doc, importantly Detective Becerra testified that Pirro also made up false allegations about him. If she was willing to make up false allegations about a fellow law enforcement colleague, Detective Becerra, a sincere professional, what would she make up about Bob? So when people poo-poo the idea that Bob was nervous about Gene Pirro coming after him, we know we are talking about a woman who was capable of lying about other law enforcement people. What would she do to Bob? Proves why Bob was afraid of her. Detective Becerra said the following. Ms. Pirro made some false accusations about you? Yes. And, and they're personal, so I'm not gonna ask you about them. <laughs> but they were untrue, right? That is correct. Okay. And it was Ms. Pirro who had you removed from the case? That is correct. <laughs> and in part, was it because Ms. Pirro wanted all the attention? I can't speak for her motives. <laughs> I no, I know that. It's fair to say that Ms. Pirro made personal allegations against you that were untrue, correct? That is correct. And they were embarrassing, were they not? Yes. And it didn't do much to help figure out what happened to Kathy Durst either, did it? No, it did not. So here you have the DA in the county where Kathy Durst disappeared, firing the guy that she apparently didn't like, that she made up stories about, and, 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 and law enforcement wants you to convict Bob Durst when they themselves failed in the investigation? When they're willing to lie about each other? What would they say about Bob? What have they said about Bob? You've heard them tell you that they believe he murdered her. But they lie. You just heard it. What do you think Bob was thinking? Again, you heard evidence that after the reopening, law enforcement searched the South Salem house again on other occasions. This is when Becerra was involved. For forensic evidence, removed pieces of the wall, went to the South Salem home on different occasions, searched hidden areas in the South Salem home, used search dogs, searched the nearby lake with divers for hours and hours in an extensive grid search searched under a shed on the property, reviewed the files, the files that uh, Susie Giordano turned over. They reviewed all of them for evidence, 
to suggest that Bob had done anything with Kathy or had conspired with Susan Berman. 52 boxes they went through. Not a single piece of evidence to suggest any of the allegations in this case. They interviewed witnesses again. Detective Scruck cooperated with them and assisted Detective Becerra and the other investigators and detectives. No new evidence was found which supported the idea that Bob had killed Kathy. That supports Detective Strzok's prior investigation. No DNA, hair analysis. There is nothing linking Bob to Mrs. Durst's disappearance from a scientific and real evidence perspective. This technology was around in 2000. Nothing new was found. It's certainly used in cold cases today. Again, no evidence is evidence that they haven't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. What is also greatly significant is that Detective Becerra testified he found no evidence supporting Susan died in the South Salem home or that Susan helped provide an alibi for Bob. This is in the reopened investigation. So with all the resources that you had available and the further investigation, you found no evidence supporting that Bobby uh, Durst had uh, hurt Mrs. Durst in the house or she had accidentally died in the house, did you? None that I found. None that anybody that you were working with found either, correct? Correct. I'd probably ask you this, but at no time did you find any physical evidence showing that Mr. Durst had talked to Susan Berman to plot any kind of strategy for Mr. Durst as far as an alibi, did you? That is correct. Accordingly, the lead detective in the reopened investigation found no evidence to support that Bob killed Kathy or that Susan Berman was a witness or assisted Mr. Durst in any criminal way. Now that mistakes the evidence. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, lawyers will be presenting uh, and making these arguments. They're, they're commenting on testimony that you heard and the evidence that was presented in this case. They're remembering the evidence as it was presented. If their memory differs from your recollection, you must follow your own recollection. These final arguments are not to be construed as evidence or as instruction on the law. You may proceed, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Becerra said, so with all the resources you had available in the further investigation, you found no evidence supporting that Bobby Durst had hurt Mrs. Durst in the house or she had accidentally died in the house, did you? None that I found. None that anybody you were working with found either, correct? Correct. I probably asked you this, but at no time did you find any physical evidence showing that Mr. Durst had talked to Susan Berman to plot any kind of strategy for Mr. Durst as far as an alibi, did you? That is correct. <coughs> Prosecution alleges that Susan Berman was a witness and helped cover up for Bob. However, let's listen to Detective Becerra again, because he never even spoke to Susan Berman, nor had any other law enforcement people spoken to her prior to her death. Now, you have told us that uh, Miss Berman was going to be one of the one of the people that you interviewed. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and, the, and so. You started in 99, and you said it lasted at least a year before her homicide, correct? Correct. And you told us that you had gotten the idea of calling her from family members, correct? Calling her or uh, visiting her, yes, from right. family and friends. But in no time did you ever go and talk to her, did you? I did not. You never called her on the phone? I did not. Never sent her an email? I did not. Never went to her house? I did not. So, and I did after she was deceased, but right. Okay. So as you sit here, you have no idea 
what evidentiary information Ms. Berman could have provided anybody about uh, Ms. Durst's disappearance, do you? I didn't get the chance. Okay. And that was by your choice, correct? It was. Okay. Did anybody else that was a policeman that you know of before Ms. Berman died ever take the time to go ask Ms. Berman if she had called Einstein? Did anybody working with you ever contact Ms. Berman? Asked and answered. Over. No. And of course, you would have been aware as lead investigator if anybody had, correct? That's correct. And finally, in the course of your review, not finally, but in the course of your review of the investigative files in New York, did you ever come across anybody thinking that Ms. Berman needed to be talked to? Ever? Reviewing the New York City files? Yes. I really don't recall to tell you the truth. I remember it was Kathy's friends and family who told me that I should interview her. Right, but Mr. Becerra, is it fair to say that as far as contacting Ms. Berman, you had never in your mind decided you were going to ask her if she called the medical school, had you? It all depended on how our interview would go. Okay, but that wasn't something that was driving you to go speak to Ms. Berman, was it? I wanted to speak to Ms. Berman because I was told she was very close with Mr. Durst. But it wasn't. that she might have important information relative to Kathy's disappearance. Yeah, but it wasn't the question of whether or not she had called Einstein, was it? That wasn't the sole reason, no. That wasn't a reason. It all depended on how the interview went. Well, did you ever write anywhere in the report or in your diary or your journals or whatever notes you kept? I need to speak to Susan Berman. Stop it there, Mr. Chairman. I I'll did. Finish. I'll finish the sentence and then you can finish the watch. Sentence. All right, because it's propitious timing. But go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, did you ever write in your report or in your diary or your journal, whatever <coughs> notes you kept, I need to speak to Susan Berman about whether she called Einstein? Answer No, I did not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, do not talk about the case or any of the people or any subject involved in it with anyone, including the other jurors. Do not make up your mind about the verdict or any issue to allow you to discuss the case with the other jurors during deliberations. We'll return at 1.30.